Good morning. Happy Thanksgiving weekend, everybody. And uh, Stephen's uh, not giving the announcements, obviously, so you get to uh, do that with me right now. Uh, we have the regular weekly things happening, Monday night prayer, Tuesday night, the women's study in Zechariah, Tuesday night, discipleship and uh, women's fellowship and so forth. Wednesday night is on with the uh, feast and fellowship and um, also a special event coming up, this Dispelling the Darkness Conference. So if, if you want to get a, a flyer for this, there's a bunch of them in the foyer. And uh, you can take one with you if there's somewhere you know you can post it at a library or in an elevator or uh, anywhere like that, then please grab one of these and post it somewhere. There's also large flyers that you can take and you can uh, give it to someone that goes to another church and maybe they'll put it up at their church. So the whole idea behind this is really to uh, expose the lies of our culture and what's been going on with the spirit of the age. So the Bible has a lot to say about everything, but has a lot to say about really what is going on with um, the spirit of the age, and we don't realize that sometimes. So the re-enchantment, paganism and the occult are normal in our society. And not just because we're on the islands of the West Coast, but, uh, it's it's become mainstream. It's in it's in churches. It's in books. It's in the media. It's in Disney. It's all over the place. Okay, so um, we've got two speakers coming in for that: Carl T. Cribb and Billy Crone, both excellent speakers, and uh, lunch is included that day. So it's a nine to five. Please register, and you can do that on the website. Also, invite others. There's a ten dollar discount right now if um, for the, for our fellowship here. Uh, if you register by the twentieth, and it's all online. Uh, if you if you can't register online, then we'll, we will take a registration in person in the office. Also, uh, last week I mentioned uh, about Earl, and to pray for Earl. And praise the Lord, he did not sign papers. For maid, yeah, and man, it's it's been such a blessing that so many people have been visiting him, and it's just been on their hearts. So no one's been you know scheduled to do it, no one's been pressured to do it. Just people just going and continuously. Even right now, I just talked to someone. They're like, "Hey, I went and saw Earl yesterday, and uh, brought him some food and so forth." And he he's a sweet brother in Christ. And that encouragement goes a long way. So God bless you. Thank you for being a missionary, going and loving Earl and seeing the others at the hospital who need encouragement too, right? And Earl is there and God has him there. Like he can be a witness. He can be a light in the hospital in his situation. So man, that's, it's just a beautiful thing to, uh, to see that. Also wanted to note uh, Bruce Hodding is, is moving up to... Cowichan, so we will miss him when he when he moves. But uh, he he could really use help. He's been a faithful brother in this fellowship, and uh, today he's got everything organized. He's got maps and addresses, but he needs some muscle. He's got uh, furniture to put into a truck and then drive it up to Cowichan. If you can help on either end or both ends in loading or unloading uh, or both, then please see Bruce. He's one of the greeters. He's in the foyer. And um, he could use help directly after the service here. Uh, so I think that's that's it for the announcements. Uh, please remember to uh, look at and open the email for the weekly e-news um, because you'll see updated things happening in that as well. In the e-news, by the way, this week is going to be uh, attachments to these flyers. So you can post them on your social media or you can put them out and invites in other ways digitally. So you can send an email out to others and just cut and paste, you know, from our email and then send it out to others and invite people to this because it's really going to be eye-opening and it's really going to bless people. So uh, I'll pray and we'll have, the, yeah, go ahead and come on up. Father, we thank you. We give thanks to you. Uh, you're the one to be thanked, God. You gave us life. You give us creation. You give us everything. And so this Thanksgiving weekend, Lord, we, 
give thanks to you. So many reasons to be thankful, Lord. And God, we, we want to lift our hearts to you, lift our eyes to you. We want to set our mind on things above. Lord, we, we just ask that you would work here today, that you would be exalted, that you would be lifted up, Lord, that we would put our eyes on you, and we thank you, Jesus, for loving us, for being the head of your church. We exalt you. We give you glory. We worship you. We give thanks to you. Let's stand together and worship the Lord with song. We have so much to be thankful for, and, and we know who we're thankful to, right? The great God. Everybody else is like, oh, I'm thankful. But who are you thankful to? We're thankful to the creator of the ends of the earth. So we're going to sing from uh, Isaiah 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the heir.
Amen. Uh, children can be dismissed, and you may be seated. Can you go get me that pulpit over there? So I, I had forgotten a couple announcements uh, as well. This coming Saturday, the nineteenth, there's a fifty-year wedding or fifty-year wedding anniversary, right? So that uh, is for the Hemmerlings, and that's a potluck this Saturday night. What time? 5 p.m. So if you'd like to come out and celebrate the faithfulness in, in their marriage, then 
it's a beautiful time to gather, to fellowship. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Fred. What an awesome witness that is. 50 years celebrating that. So everybody's invited. Uh, it's a potluck style feast celebration and a time of fellowship. So that's a wonderful thing. Also on the following Saturday after that at 1 p.m. on Saturday the 26th, there's going to be a financial update. We chose to move it to Saturday just to keep it uh, Sundays more open for worship and then fellowship afterwards and so forth. So business Saturday, 1 p.m. You can always find these things in the e-newsletter. And then uh, one more thing that I forgot was the trip to Israel. So um, Israel and Jordan, uh, it's, it's amazing. So going, going on a trip there is uh, what one of our pastors said was like a year in Bible college, just going there to be in the land, looking at the events and uh, so forth. So I'm gonna give an introduction here in our uh, text um, of Matthew chapter 24, and then Michelle's gonna come up and, and read the section for us. But first, I, I wanna pray and get us focused and then give an introduction here. So, Lord, we, we want our eyes on eternity. There's so much going on in the world, and there's lots of confusion. There's lots of distraction. There's lots of disruption. And, oh, Lord, there's a lot of deception. We pray that you would help us to hone in, Lord, to calibrate, to focus, to tune in, to have our hearts just put in place where they ought to be. Lord, keep us from evil in the evil day. Lord, fill us with your love and a, a desire for you and the things that are right and true. Lord, I, uh, my life is a total witness of how you can take someone out of lies and help them see and know and hear. And I believe my brothers and sisters could say the same here, Lord. We pray, God, that you would help us to walk in the light and have fellowship. And that, Lord, you would indeed, like the title of the conference theme, Lord, dispel the darkness. Keep doing it, Lord. And we thank you for your word that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, Jesus is, has been teaching his disciples. It's the Tuesday before the crucifixion and his death and resurrection. Last hours, really, and Jesus is giving a teaching on the Mount of Olives to his disciples. They asked him some questions about when the end of the age is, what will be the sign of his coming and his return, and Jesus is answering those questions, and he described that, that the end of the age is going to be like the days of Noah, and we went through a bit of that last week, what that would be like, but really in general, the world is not going to be expecting the Lord to intervene. And that's what it was like in the days of Noah. Everybody was going about their will, their business, living in their deception and, and for themselves and in sin, worshiping the false gods and so forth in the creation. In the days of Noah, they weren't expecting a judgment. And he said, in the end days of this age, it will be similar. People will be living for pleasure. People will be living for self. People will not be watching. They will not be expecting. And they will not be prepared in general. So Jesus instructs his disciples to be ready and be watchful, to be expectant that the Lord can come any time at an hour you do not expect. And we aren't to live as the world does. The way the world's living is, is chaos and it's empty. And they're, they're not whole and they don't have hope and they don't have uh, light for their path. Our priorities are different. Our values are different. And our expectation is quite different. We know what's coming upon the world. We have the Holy Scriptures. We have God's word. The expectancy of his return teaches us to live 
uh, soberly minded and hopeful and godly and wise, not foolish and sinful. Well, Jesus continues the teaching and uh, although it may seem slow as we're going through this text, the point isn't to get through the text fast. The point is to get the point. That's the point. So we're going to finish Matthew 24, and Michelle's going to come on up and, and read that for us. If you could please stand. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made rule, ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. Then the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him into and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the Lord's word. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Michelle. So we've got to see this in the context, and the context being that of Jesus preaching and teaching his disciples about what the return will be like. He's, this is smashed in between uh, a few parables of the fig tree and the, the coming parables in chapter 25 and of the instruction that no one knows the day or the hour that the Lord is going to be coming back. And so what are you to do if you know that accountability is coming. You know, like I, I said last week about the children whom their parents go off into uh, a, a date night and then the children are uh, playing around, but they were told, hey, we're gonna be coming back, have this and that done. And, and the children ought to be aware, they ought to, but you know, most of the time as children um, will, they, they will do the fun things and, and disregard the important things. They will do uh, whatever seems best at the moment to them and so forth. It's not often you're going to find a very wise child who's going to prepare everything, get everything done and so forth. And not out of fear, but really out of love and out of wisdom, right? And so uh, here Jesus describes who a faithful and wise servant is and the opposite who a unfaithful and foolish servant is and the rewards and what's going to happen when the master returns, the master of that servant. And the translation of your Bible may read in verse 45, steward or slave or servant. Um, you know, to, first though, to have any application for yourself, and under, you need to understand where you fit in the text and you also need to understand where where God fits, where Jesus fits in a, in a given text. And there's really just three parties here. Well, two, if you want to put it that way, there's a servant and there's a master. Uh, or you could say there's a faithful servant, there's an unfaithful servant, and there's a master. And so would you put yourself in the shoes of the master in the story, or would you put yourself in the shoes of the servant? And where would you put Jesus in the story? Would you put him in the position of the master or, or the servant and so forth? So a wise steward and a foolish steward, uh, we must be willing to consider ourselves in the position of that steward or that servant. And many in our day would be offended by thinking of themselves as servants. That would be offensive to many in our day, I think. In, in the Greek, the word is doulos, doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S. It's one of the first Greek words I ever heard about because I saw uh, a guy wearing a tattoo that said doulos all over his big, broad shoulders. And I remember wondering what that was. And so, um, you know, I found out, and the, the word doulos means slave. And a slave in Jesus' day is either voluntary or involuntary. Someone could choose to be a bond slave, a free will slave. And uh, Jesus hasn't forced any one of you to be here today. 
Jesus hasn't forced me to be here. He has never forced me to love him. He has never forced me into a relationship for that wouldn't be a real relationship. Uh, he has offered himself and I respond with uh, love and like kind. So our case, it is voluntary, a bond slave, a free will slave, a doulos, one who chooses to be a servant because they know that their master is good. And it's better to live under our master than not under our master. Two definitions of doulos. One is this, one who gives himself up to another's will. A second definition is one who is devoted to another to the disregard of his own interests. Devoted to another to the disregard of his own interests. And in Jesus' day, obviously, I don't think that anyone would have had to uh, get an elaboration or definition of what a doulos was and what a servant or a slave or a steward was. They understood servanthood. But in our culture, I think it needs to be elaborated on and defined. So before we go further in this, that's what I'm doing right now. We have a culture that is so self-entitled. It is sick with selfishness. Our culture is inundated with, with trying to find the God in every individual. And, and it doesn't work. It's not true. The internet, social media, sociopolitical movement of uh, really it's victimization, victimhood. The, the government teaching everybody is uh, dependent and, and everybody needs to be uh, you know, individually realized and understood and heard and seen and known and all of these things really, really falls apart. And, and around the back side of it, it actually destroys identity. It doesn't build it. And so can you shut those doors for me, please? Um, also, the, the culture is pushing this through not just the government and the media and so forth, but it's a religious concept that the government and, and all of our society is really promoting, that it, giving people the impression that if they are not promoted, if they are not uh, given attention to, and if they are not celebrated for whatever they believe themselves to be, then that is somehow wrong. Have you seen that? That, that we are living in a lifetime now, a, a time where people are just inflated with this false idea a grandiose idea of how individuals ought to be uh, approved of and worshiped ultimately. That, that if, if you don't approve of someone and what they do or what they think, you've done something morally wrong. Now, that's ultimately exceedingly damaging, this deserving attitude. And while some uh, think that they have this right, and then others might poke at that, and it's got a very thin veneer, by the way. You don't have to do much to offend the idea that someone is, is somehow entitled to always being right. Um, as soon as you poke it, it, it bursts, it erupts. And that eruption can take on many different emotions, but really it's a tantrum. That's what it is. It's an immature idea, and then a tantrum as though I, I don't, deserve that. What do you mean? Because one's own thoughts of who they are uh, is that they should be worshiped ultimately. And it's a recipe for a terrible society, and it will implode in on itself. I'm sharing this because when you come to Christ, you ought to have found th that, that freedom from that mentality is, is a wonderful thing. Freedom from the mentality that that I need to provide everything or someone else you know, needs to worship me and, and that it's all about me. Freedom from self. Besides the forgiveness of Christ, maybe the most wonderful thing that I've found in Christ, the, the grace of God, the love of God, to know who I am and freedom from the idea that, that everything revolves around me. You know, it, it puts us in a position of thankfulness, of gratitude, of reality, where our, then I'm able to find out who I actually am. 
I can't even control my heartbeat or the, my lungs. There's so much I can't control. And I found I don't make a good God. And neither do you. Nobody does but God. He's the only God, the one true and living God. And Hinduism teaches it, New Age teaches it, and our selfish, celebrity-driven culture teaches it, that this idea that everybody is God. Well, everybody's not God. Only God is God. And we're God's creatures. We're created by an omnipotent, omniscient, loving, omnipresent God, a wonderful God. And he's, he's given us such things to enjoy. That's what being a steward is. We're stewards over all that God has allowed us to have. And we get to serve the Lord. See, when, when you realize that you're not God and only God is God, you find freedom from this lie and deceit. And you find true life and value, you find meaning, you find your place, you begin to know what's right and what's wrong, what's, what is darkness from light, truth from error. And there's no reason that you should be worshiped. And you let go of that worship of self and the worship of this fake world, this clown world. And, and then, in, in really, it's a humility and trust. You turn to God, and, and it becomes a love and a submission and a realization that, you know, my worst days are the days I haven't turned to God. My worst days are the days where I'm not submitting to God. And my happiest and best is when I'm actually submitted to God. See, the lie in the world is God's bad, God's mean, God's not cool, God is a killjoy, and your life will suck if you turn your life over to God. I believed that as a teenager. I thought that. That's what MTV and everything else told me. That is such a lie. I was never more depressed when I didn't know God. I was never more lost when I didn't know and surrender to God. When you surrender to God, you find out who you are. You find out the meaning to everything. When you read the Bible, you get your mind washed from lies, from junk, from garbage, and you start uh, finding your real value and hope and God's generosity and, and the goodness and purpose. You're happier when you serve others than serving yourself and trying to get everybody to serve you. You get all offended, like, they're not serving me. They're not helping me. They're not giving to me. Well, who do you think you are? You know, and when you, your mind changes and you're like, wow, I get to serve, I get to love, I get to give, I get to be other centered. See, the world had it so backwards. The world tells you to ignore God and to uh, love things, to use people and worship yourself. That's absolutely backwards because the one to be worshiped is God, not self. And what is to be loved are people, not things. And, and we're to use things for the using. And self, where does it come in? Last, ignore self. When you start ignoring yourself and you start using things, loving people, worshiping God, your life is in order and it works and it's wonderful. So willingly becoming a doulos, a bond slave, a, a surrendered one to the real master is putting life in order. And again, that definition of a doulos, one who gives himself up to another's will. I, I heard someone put it this way. It's one whose will is swallowed up in the will of another. And sometimes as Christians, we think, oh, well, you know, I've given God this area, I've given him that area, I've given him that area, but not these areas. What about your will? The very center of who you are. You can think about what you would do. You can feel what you'd like to do. What will you do? How about your will? Giving him your very inner being. And he becomes your master and your Lord. One who is devoted to the, uh, another, to the disregard of one's own interests. Didn't that look like the early church? Does that sound like a good definition of these guys who turned the world upside down? Devoted to the will of another, to the disregard of their own interests. And God's will is that we love him and we love others. That's very good. That's a great and wonderful way to live. 
And, and so when he becomes your master or your Lord, and you're happy to be his servant, Paul. Paul described himself, Romans chapter 1, verse 1, right off the bat, as a bond servant of Jesus. Paul says, here I am, church. I'm not the, you know, all in all, I am a bond slave of Jesus. You know what James called himself? A bond slave of Jesus. Do you know what Peter called himself? A bond slave of Jesus. And that's in 2 Peter 1, James 1. In Hebrews 3, it speaks of Moses and says, Moses was faithful as a servant. Moses, he was ruler over the children of Israel for over 40 years. He was a servant, faithful as a servant. Throughout the epistles, there's other areas where Paul is mentioning Epaphras. And he says, Epaphras, I love that guy. He's a fellow servant. He's a fellow servant. Epaphras says, call me a servant. No, Epaphras is happy to be a fellow servant. Are, are, are you okay if someone calls you a servant? What about if someone treated you like one? You know? Yeah, it's, it's this mentality that's totally different than the world. And my question is simple, and we're going to get into the text here. Do you identify yourself and understand yourself to be gladly a bondservant of Jesus? Will you take that on? Will you accept that? Or do you still hold lordship over your own life? Who sits on the throne in your centermost being? Are you on the throne or is Jesus on the throne? Again, you don't make a good God. Jesus can run your life better than you can. I can tell you for certain you will never be happier than when you are in full trust and submission to Jesus. Now, the text. Jesus contrasts a faithful and wise servant with an unfaithful and foolish servant who's really not being a servant, are they? They're just using their master's goods and abusing the others around them and not being a servant. They're self-serving. So you're either in a position of being a servant or self-serving. That's one of the two. Those are our choices. In verse 45 of Matthew 24, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give him, them food in due season? The ser servants all have a responsibility to serve, obviously, to be faithful with what's been entrusted to you you know, everything that's, that's been given to them, they're to be faithful with it. Everyone who's held a job at any point in your life, you understand this. We should, right? And I know one of the brothers in the church used to, to work as a security detail in, in the company he worked for. And I remember him telling me some crazy fact about how many people steal from the businesses they work for. And it was like, I don't remember if it was 30% or 60%, but I remember thinking, that's shocking. Wow. This, and, and so it was internal, <laughs> trying to find the employees that were stealing was his job. So a servant has a responsibility. And what responsibility do we have? Well, uh, we have not only a responsibility to be a good steward with everything that's been entrusted to us. Your life has been entrusted to you. Your mind has been entrusted to you. Your, your um, heart. So your spirit, everything that you have has been entrusted to you. What do you do with it? What do we do with it? Uh, not only that, your time and your energy and your output then is entrusted to you. What do you do when it comes to uh, production, to serving and helping others? We have a responsibility to help others, to love others, and to make things better. So, we have personal and corporate responsibility. I just maybe put it that way, internal and external. And we are stewards of all that God has given us. Everything we have, at the end of the day, it's borrowed and temporary. You can't take it with you. Everything we have has been given to us. And, and we're stewards over it. To what end do we have these things? You know, if, if you have procured something and if someone trashes it, does that upset you? If, you? if you've lent something to someone and they wreck it and they return it in a poor state, that's really disrespectful. 
And so likewise, like God has given you your life. What do you do with it? Well, the faithful and wise servant knows everything is and is in and under the house of his master. Well, who who rules the world truly? At the end of the day, Jesus is going to sit on the throne. He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he's the only one that that deserves the title. And so, everything is to be under his house in that sense. And so a faithful and wise servant is aware of his place and his responsibility. And it says here in the text uh, that he gives others food in due season. Jesus' disciples, uh, in, in back a year or two before this, earlier in Matthew's gospel, they were in Galilee. And hundreds, not even hundreds, thousands went out to hear Jesus' teaching out in the hillsides. And he had them sit down in the green grass, and they were a distance from the cities. And it got to be evening time, and people were hungry. And the disciples said, it's late, Jesus. Send them away to go get some food because they're going to get, they're hungry. And Jesus says, no, don't send them away. You give them something to eat. And they said, where are we going to get food at this hour? We don't even have enough money for it and so forth. And Jesus commissioned his servants, his disciples, to go feed others. Well, it says here in the text, a faithful and wise servant is going to give others food in due season. After Jesus dies and rises from the dead and visits his disciples, he's speaking with Peter. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, you know, Lord. And then what does he tell Peter? Feed my sheep. Give them food. Tend my lambs. Care for the young. Tend others and feed others. Take care of others. That's a good steward. That's a good servant. That's a good parent to a child. Taking care of protecting and feeding and blessing others around you. And so a faithful and wise servant distributes the spiritual food of God's word to the starving souls of this world. A faithful and wise servant of the Lord has good words to give, has blessing to give, has spent time at the Lord's feet receiving from the Lord, and then has something to give others. In verse 46 and 47, blessed is that servant, happy, blessed is the servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. The Lord is blessed, and that servant is blessed when when God is pleased when he finds his servants doing what he has told them and instructed them to do. God's pleased with that. And not only is God pleased with that, that servant is going to be well pleased. Why? Because 47, assuredly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. When God finds that you're faithful with what he's given you, he will give you more to be faithful with. It's a simple principle. When you've been responsible with what God's, something God's given you, God will give you more to be responsible with. And it's not like all the anxiety and weight of that responsibility is now on you. We, in some ways, we live in a culture that avoids responsibility. We want all the praise, we want all of the privilege, and we want no responsibility to come with it. You know, that's what like uh, friends with benefits is and all this garbage, this, this horrible anti-marriage and anti-family society we live in. We want all the privileges and that much responsibility to take care of others. That's backwards. The Lord would have us to be faithful and be faithful with a little. And the Lord says, that's right. How are you faithful with something? You're faithful with something as you entrust it to the Lord. As you say, Lord, you've given me something to be faithful with. I remember when I was first married and I thought, whoa, okay, Lord, this is a precious gift. But in my hands, I'm going to mess it up. And I remember thinking this, real simple terms. I need, I need to give this to you. I need you to hold this and carry this for me. I, I, need, I need, it's enough for me just to seek you with all my heart, to love you, and, and Lord, carry this. And the Lord gave me more. He gave me children. He gave me more responsibility and more responsibility. And, and I, I've done the same thing now that I've always done, been in the continual practice of giving it all back to the Lord. And saying, Lord, would you carry this? Would you take the weight of this? I'm going to be faithful. And I'm just going to 
just to be a servant here. And, and so a faithful and wise servant is going to be pleasing to the Lord and, and rewarded. He's been given a job to do and does it and takes it seriously and, and takes it to heart and knows it's really best for the Lord, his master, it's best for others, and it's best for themselves. Jesus will return and find us doing something one day. It's not a, it's, this isn't a fear uh, in, you know, based motivator. Hopefully, it, it should be out of love, which is a greater motivator than fear. Fear is an amazing motivator. Love is actually greater than the fear motivator, by the way. Perfect love casts out all fear. It was love that led Paul to be decapitated for his Lord. It was love that led Peter to be crucified upside down. It was love that, that enabled these uh, early disciples to do amazing feats and acts, which changed the world, honestly. And love is a greater motivator than fear. Well, Jesus is going to return. And blessed is that servant that when he returns, he finds so doing, serving. And not only should we have that understanding of who we are, but who our master is, that he deserves our service. God is holy. God is uh, wonderful. God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. Who do we think we are to not serve God? Really? I mean, it's a rebuke, but it's a right one, isn't it? It's a confrontation to our entitlement. It's a confrontation to our selfishness, but it's absolutely right. And if we were to just, just to get a window and a glimpse of God's power and might, boy, we would serve him out of fear the rest of our minutes and seconds. You know, an almighty, all-powerful God who created everything. I mean, incredibly powerful. But God doesn't do that. He came humbly. He came as a servant of all. The one who is the perfect servant, because we will all fail, is Jesus. And he came lowly. And he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I think it's Mark 12, maybe around verse 45. I love that scripture. Because the one who deserves all praise made himself a, a humble infant, laid in a feeding trough, poor, lowly, he didn't come exalting himself, look at me, all grandiose. He didn't come with a glorious uh, vision and, and armies and so forth and servants. He came and he served. He's the one who took up the towel and girded himself and washed the disciples' feet. He's the one who laid down his life first. God is our perfect example of servanthood. And, and when we are faithful, then he gives us more to be faithful with. It really reminded me of Joseph. Abraham is Joseph's great-grandfather. Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. Well, Rachel was the wife Jacob loved and, and desired and wanted first and foremost, and that's a whole story to itself. Joseph was their first son. And... Uh, than Benjamin, their second. Well, Joseph was favored among his brothers. He was given this special robe, and he was just favored. And did he have a sense of entitlement? I don't know. It doesn't actually say that he did. But from what we see of his character, it doesn't seem like he did. But his brothers really were jealous, and they were upset that Joseph was being favored by their father. Well, they took Joseph and they dug a pit and they threw him in it, in it and they took his special robe that his father had given him and they tore it up and they killed a goat and they put blood on it and they, they, they decided, here's what we'll do with Joseph. We won't kill him. We won't murder our brother. Instead, we'll sell him as a slave to the slave traders and we'll never see him again this way. So they did it. They sold their brother as a slave. That betrayal was great. And, and then they took the bloody robe to their father. And he wept and he mourned over the loss of his son, assuming his son was dead because that was the story they gave their father. Very evil act. Well, the slave traders took him where? Down to Egypt. 
and he was sold on the slave market, and it was an officer of the government named uh, Potiphar who saw Joseph, understood Joseph was educated, and uh, he was a teenager or a young man, 20s, he was, sorry, and, and he took Joseph and he brought him in as a slave in his house. You know, Joseph didn't say, yeah, but my father has 400 employees, Abraham. Or Abraham did, so Jacob had more, excuse me. His great-grandfather had 400. Like, Joseph was going to be raised up to lead a nation. But now he's a slave in Egypt. What did he do? He served. He served Potiphar as a slave. It, 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 there's not one record of him complaining. There's not one record of him acting entitled. But he, there is a record where it's, it shows that he chose to trust God in his circumstance, and he chose to be faithful in serving his master, Potiphar. And in time, he was placed over the whole house of Potiphar. And, and then what happened to Joseph then? Well, a, a, he was framed. I'm trying to cut the story short. Joseph was framed, and he was lied about, and Potiphar knew it was a lie. And so he had to, though, be punished, and he was sent to the prison. Now, it's interesting because the prison he was sent to was the prison of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. It was a, it was a political prison in that sense. It's where all of the king's prisoners would go because Potiphar was an officer in the government. And so after being an overseer there of the house, he's now in jail, wrongfully accused and sent to prison with the prisoners. And in that prison, Joseph chose to trust God and be faithful and serve to the point where the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all of the prisoners who were in the prison, whatever they did there, it was Joseph's doing. I'm quoting the Bible. So Joseph is now in charge of all of the prisoners' activities in the prison. So faithful and wise was Joseph as a servant in the prison that the warden, the keeper, didn't look into anything that was under Joseph's authority. Incredible. He became the overseer within the prison as a prisoner. So he was a slave. He was a prisoner. And through a series of events, Joseph's character caught the attention of Pharaoh himself through other political prisoners, and one was released back into Pharaoh's court, mentioned Joseph's name to Pharaoh at one point. Well, when this is years passing. When Pharaoh needed help at a certain time, this other person in Pharaoh's court said, oh, Joseph can help you. There's a man in the prison who can help you, Pharaoh. Call for him. Joseph gets sent to the court with Pharaoh. And Joseph ends up being used by the Lord in that event to give wisdom and blessing to Pharaoh to, to the degree where in serving Pharaoh, Joseph was raised up and set over all of Pharaoh's house not only over Pharaoh's house, but even over all of Egypt, the powerful empire of the day. And so I'm going to read a section of that to you in Genesis chapter 41, verse 37. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said, now his character lined up with his words, mind you, his servant heartedness. Verse 39, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. 
And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. He was faithful. Joseph at the beginning was favored by his father. His father loved him. He knew who he was. His identity was was there. And though even his brothers betrayed him and he was put into a pit, sold as a slave, I believe that carried him through to the point where he knew not only his father's love, but he knew God, his father's love. And he trusted God in the circumstance he was in. No, it wasn't a good circumstance. No, it was not enjoyable whatsoever. He must have dearly missed his mother and father and his brother. But then as he served, he was risen up to be over Potiphar's house. And then another circumstance lands him in prison, not of his own doing. He was faithful. What kind of reward is this? And and there in the prison, he gave it all to God and he served and he was faithful And he becomes over the prison house. And then from there, look at the elevation where God raised him up. And did he act like a Lord over everybody? Not for a minute. He acted like a servant. He had the heart of a servant, not the heart of a Lord or a victim. And now Jesus, back in Matthew chapter 24, goes into the attitude and the mind of an evil servant, and evil is you're not whole, you're missing it. Verse 48 back in Matthew 24 says, but if that evil servant says in his heart, my master's delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day, there's gonna be the response when the master just shows up, will come on a day when he's not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of. Ooh, he's going to get caught. You know, he, the, the police are showing up. Now, the, the Lord of the master over this guy's boss, everything, if you can think of it, is showing up. The authority is showing up. And it says in verse 51, and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. Because he has a position to do one thing and he's doing an opposite thing with it. He says, he gives lip service to his master. When he knows, oh, the master's coming tomorrow. Everybody clean up, clean up. All right, yeah, we're here, we're good. You know, could I get a raise? You know, and then his master leaves town and what's he do? He's super abusive. He's not doing the right thing at all. And instead of feeding others with the food that was apportioned to him, He's getting drunk with it. He's inviting his buddies over. He's he's abusing what he was a steward over. Not only that, he's beating the fellow servants. Why? Because he's lazy. He's like, double your work. Do mine too. He's lording it over. That's why he's beating the fellow servants. He has a terrible attitude when the master's not there. You think God doesn't know what our life is about? Is he somehow aloof? Is he, is, does he not, is he not aware of our quiet time? Of, of what's happening when the camera isn't on or something like this? The Lord knows. And so this servant, though, has this attitude. Look what he told himself in verse 40, uh, 48. He says something in his heart. He has convinced himself, my master is delaying his coming. So then his, his behavior follows his mindset. So he's, he's convinced himself, I'm not accountable. He's convinced himself, and he thinks inside of his heart, not only will he not be accountable for today's behavior, but he also thinks his life is about pleasing himself. He also thinks that he should be doing these things, and, and he, he should be getting, you know, Uh, served rather than serving, and he will use his position 
to serve his own selfish desires, not his master's desires. His true master is his self. That's his true master. He's, he's, he's intoxicated with sin and the fleshly lusts, and he's consuming the food of the world. And this mentality is, is very foolish, unwise, because the master is going to come at an hour he isn't expecting and he isn't aware. There will be an account. And instead of rewards and praise and blessing like the faithful and wise servant, the unfaithful and foolish servant is going to get severe punishment. Severe punishment. Fitting for who this servant is truly. Selfish. Mistreating what his master has given him. Living for self and living for sin. And may I say that's not why God gave us our life. God didn't give us our life so we could live in sin and treat it like a garbage can. God didn't give us our life so we could ruin it and ruin others. God gave us life so we could abide in him, rely upon him, walk in him, and God's love would be expressed in us and through us. And that is your best life. That is my best life. Judas reminded me of a bad servant, of this evil servant. Judas happened to be the steward over the money bag that Jesus and the disciples carried. It was, it was Judas's role to be the team steward in their ministry. And, and I think that's amazing that Jesus gave him that role. I think it's just incredible because the Lord knew what was in his heart. But in John chapter 12, it gives us a window into Judas's heart. It's not the only place, but it's one of them. And what happens in John chapter 12 is, is Mary, it's a family, Mary, Lazarus, and Martha. Well, Mary takes this exceedingly costly oil that she has, the, the worth of a dowry, and she breaks it open, this flask of oil, and pours it on Jesus' feet. And she takes her hair, and she washes Jesus' feet with her hair in this oil. And the whole house is filled with this aroma. The whole house just smells wonderfully of this aroma where Mary had taken this pound of very costly oil and anointed his feet. And then it says this about Judas. Judas speaks up in verse 4 of John 12. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Oh, that sounds great, right? So, so oh, this is what we could do. We are servants. Why, why waste it on worshiping God, on loving God? Why didn't we sell it and give to the poor? In verse 6, then, he, then this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. That's a hypocrite. That's an evil servant. That's an unwise servant. Obviously, the disciples eventually knew. They were always wondering, like, man, we're always low on cash, you know? Jesus, please do another miracle. Like, we'd like lunch. You know, I thought we had more in there. And then they obviously find out to the point where John records this. Maybe he enjoyed recording that because he was a thief. <laughs> Something like that. Well, Judas had the opportunity, like all of the other disciples, to be a servant. He saw the miracles. He was loved perfectly by Jesus. He had the teachings of Jesus, and he could have been faithful. What was his problem? 
What was Judas's problem? There was something off in his heart, wasn't there? I think Judas had his own mind of how things should go. He, he thought about Jesus in a different way. It wasn't thy will be done in every circumstance, in any case, even though I don't understand it, even though it might be hard for me to bear, even though I'm confused, even though sometimes I don't know what to do, thy will be done. Judas thought, I could do this better. In some cases, my will be done. In some cases, I should increase and others should decrease. And, and I think Judas had this mind and expectations of what he would like to see his master doing for him. And rather than just being a humble servant and trusting the promises, trusting that God does know, trusting that God is perfect in all of his wisdom, and he will work all things together for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes, that, that God is, is merciful, kind, benevolent, long-suffering, patient, and all of the wonderful attributes you could ever dream of. And there's something in Judas that was unsurrendered. He did not trust the character of God. He trusted himself, that I will do it for myself. I must find happiness for myself. I must strive and work things out so that I'm, and he's maintaining control rather than surrendered. If you haven't come to the end of yourself, then you at some point need to. There was something in Judas where I believe he th thought, obviously, Jesus is a great man. I'll go to church for him. Oh, I'll give or, well, in his case, he stole. But, you know, he spent time. He spent three years, like the others, walking around, being part of this group. And no doubt, I think he thought Jesus was a great man. But Jesus was still not something in his life, and that is master. And as such... Judas, because of his heart, became this foolish and unwise evil servant. Well, would you like to be a faithful servant? Or will you choose to be an evil servant? Would you like to be a Joseph or a Judas. And the truth is, uh, we, we've been given much. And even though you may think your much is little, what will you do with it? What do we do with it? And are we thankful? We are accountable to that which we have been given and we are stewards over. And the best thing you can do is to walk humbly with God, to take all that he's given you and surrender it all to him, to be faithful and to be wise. And of course, Jesus is the perfect servant. Everywhere you failed to be a good servant, there is mercy, there is forgiveness, there is cleansing, there is blessing available in Christ. And we can make that choice to move forward. It, yesterday we had the, was the Day of Atonement for Israel in the Jewish feast calendar. The Day of Atonement, by the way, they have no atonement. There's no sacrifices. And um, Heather gets the email from the local synagogue and, you know, they started out like, oh, there's atonement for us. We have atonement. And it like sounds almost Christian. And you're like, what's going on? We, we have atonement. And that means a sacrifice is made so that there's forgiveness for us. And then they say this. By our good works, we atone. 
I mean, there's no more sacrifices anymore because there's no more temple and there's, we, they don't sacrifice lambs and these things. But, but our good works make that atonement happen and we can even do good works so others can be atoned for. Well, good luck with that. That's not even old covenant. Not only is that not biblical, it's not even old covenant uh, biblical. <laughs> They're so deceived. The message I'm giving is not be a better person and try to be a better servant and be faithful and you better get your act together and you better just, just be better people. Like that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that I know a God who makes the unfaithful faithful. I know a God who changes your heart so that you find serving wonderful. I know a God who who turns your grouchiness into glory, who turns like your heart and makes it right and washes you. Because when you stop being God and in control of your life and you worship the God who is God, things go right, things get right, things are in place and the burden is off your shoulders and you get to serve. Do we have that mindset, I get to serve? Wherever you are and whatever's going on in your life. Let's have the worship team come up. And speaking of that atonement, we're going to have communion. Jesus has provided for us the forgiveness of our sins that is available through the new covenant. That he died because we're imperfect, because we have all fallen short. We've all sinned. And he gave up his perfect life to make atonement for us. And he gives us a new heart, a new heart. Maybe that's what we need to be reminded of as Christians today. If you're not a believer in Jesus, give him your heart. It's very simple. God, I realize that I don't make a good God, that I've been on the throne of my own heart, and I don't want to be there anymore. I want you to be on the throne of my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me, and I understand that you died so I could be forgiven, that you rose from the dead so I could have eternal life, and I accept, and I believe that. And that's giving your heart to the Lord. That's giving your life to the Lord. And how wonderful it is to have him Lord of your life. Amen? So... As the song's played, communion's gonna be passed out, but I'm gonna pray now, and then we'll pass it out, okay? Father, thank you for your love to us, that you who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And Lord, with my brothers and sisters here, we don't wanna be like Judas. Lord, we wanna be like Joseph. And if we need a heart change, if we need adjustment, if we need a check, Lord, then we welcome it, trusting that you know what's best and you're good. Lord, we want to surrender to you in faith, believing that your will is better for me than my will for me, trusting that you know the end from the beginning and you're a great God. So, Lord, I yield to you. I worship you. Here's my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's think about the words from Ephesians 1 and 2 as we listen to this song. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together 
in one all things in Christ in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself it is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast for we only have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ I think everybody's it's been passed out here. So um, interesting that it, it mentions betrayal in the recounting of uh, the communion time, the Lord's Supper here, because that's that's what G Judas had done, right? He he called himself a servant, and yet he lived in betrayal. And it says, "For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you." that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, thank you that you became the servant of all, that you were broken, Lord, that you're a better than Joseph, Lord, that you were put in the worst of pits, had the worst of betrayals, that you were beaten for us. And you did this to serve us. Lord, not to compare or shame or to condemn, but Lord, you did this so that you would be in all ways compassionate to us and merciful to us, for you know our weaknesses. And you took our sin upon your shoulders. And we thank you for, for that, Lord Jesus. We thank you for being the sacrifice, for being the Lamb of God, and that it's not by works that we are saved. We thank you, Jesus. Let's partake of the bread in remembrance of his body broken. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you that your blood was shed once and for all, that it is finished, that atonement was made, that the sacrifice you made is the only and perfect sacrifice. We thank you, Jesus, that we don't sweat for our redemption, that we don't work for our forgiveness. We thank you, Jesus, that you paid the price once and for all. And we thank you, Jesus, that you give us a new heart in the new covenant 
You take out a hard heart, a stony heart, and you put in us a new heart by your spirit. Lord, that's a miracle. That's only something you can do. And we thank you for that. Let's partake of the cup with remembrance and thanks that Jesus died for our sins. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, we do proclaim the gospel until you return, that you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. And Lord, we know that we have victory in Jesus. Lord, we, we just again remember how we uh, want to be those who are yielded, surrendered, and say, take it all, have it all. Lord, and, and to no better hands can we place our life than into yours, the ones that were pierced for us. Lord, we give you glory and we thank you. Let's worship. I will serve thee because I love thee. Take my
so happy as those who are happy in Jesus. It's true. It's true. So, you know, maybe uh, if it's a humbling, if it's a correction course for us, guess what that does for your Thanksgiving? Makes you really thankful. That's what it does, you know. So let's be thankful and just really rejoice in the Lord. Offer praise to God, you know, this evening, tomorrow, just giving thanks to God. Be bold about it. And watch, watch it, even as you begin just turning your mind and giving thanks for all the amazing number of reasons we have. It just, your attitude will follow, you know? So do it in faith. Watch what happens. So God bless you. Have a great week. Have a happy Thanksgiving. This Saturday, there's a potluck and a celebration. Just check the e-news for the things that are going on. Okay, be blessed.